Hey everyone, welcome back to Crime Weekly News. I'm Derek Lavasser. And I'm Stephanie Harlow. And tonight is going to be a little different. It's not going to be your typical Crime Weekly News. We're going to be covering Preble Penny tonight. I'm not going to get into the specifics. Stephanie's going to do that in a minute. But as far as why we're doing this, I, I think everybody who watches or listens to us by this point knows that Stephanie and I started a coffee company a little over a year ago, more than a year ago. It's like a year and a half at this point Mm -hmm. called Criminal Coffee Company. Uh, Really great coffee, completely objective opinion there, of course. Um, But the whole premise, the whole purpose behind doing this was finding ways to give back to some of the cases that we cover, right? We talk about these cases all the time. And in many instances, it's an investigatory thing. But in some situations, even on cases we don't cover, it's a financial thing, right? They have something that can be tested, specifically DNA. They just don't have the finances to provide to get the resources or the science or technology available to run all the tests that can be run and potentially solve the case. So we decided to start this coffee company. We donate a portion of the proceeds from every bag sold to the Criminal Coffee Fund. We reach out to different agencies, different organizations who are looking for funding for these cases. We pick one. We go from there. So we started the company. We raised the funds. We, we were so excited. We didn't even have the funds yet for the first one. Stephanie and I chipped in our own money because we just wanted to. We were like, no, we need to do this. This is, this is exciting. We want to get it going. So many of you probably already know, but we went out to Utah, did all this stuff. It was probably, what, six, eight months ago, Stephanie? It was longer than that. Even longer than it took a very long time, but it was something where we really wanted to. Actually, I think it was last winter. I think it was a year ago. All right. So it's been a while. It's Mm -hmm. been a while. And yeah, it was. It was. Because remember when we went to Salt Lake, they were, it was November. It was exactly a year ago because they were starting to put up Christmas decorations. And I walked around that city for hours. You're right. And so this just proves the point. These cases can take a while to solve, even when you Mm -hmm. have the resources. So we're proving the point here. But overall, we we really wanted this first one to be a success because we know that people out there are looking for results. They're like a results-driven world that we live in. They wanted to see their money go to something positive and have that outcome that we were really hoping for, even though we knew it, it, there was a strong possibility it wouldn't happen for, for, for circumstances or situations behind the scenes that were out of our control. Fortunately, that was not the case, which brings us to a current day where we did the press conference the other day, the the live stream. It was not the best. The uh, audio was not great. Um, Our the service that we used to do the streaming wasn't the same. So Stephanie was a rock star and got it up and running quick. Um, And Detective Turner actually reached out to me after the fact and apologized. He basically had everything prepared, including a great PowerPoint and you know all this other stuff. But just that one little thing, and we've all done it where you forget, like, shit, didn't have a microphone. (laughs) Like, That's kind of important. (laughs) Kind of important. But, I mean, the people there heard, and and that's why we said on the live stream that we were going to do this. We've talked about Preble Penny a little bit before this, but we've never really given it the crime weekly treatment. Now we can do that. Now that everything is out there, we can talk about the case before we got involved and then where we are today. And who better to do that than the great... Stephanie Harlow. All right. Too much pressure. (laughs) Okay. So we'll start with the discovery of the remains. This happened on May 25th, 1968. The skeletal remains of an unidentified individual were located in Eaton, which is in Ohio, Preble County. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, otherwise known as NamUs, uh, there were some children who were playing in a wooded area. They found a skull that was separated from a badly decomposed body trunk with a left arm intact. Apparently, the fingers of this left arm were hooked onto a small tree. The lower right arm was missing. There was no clothing or jewelry. The skull was actually found 75 feet downstream from the rest of the body, and we believe that this body kind of came to the surface because it had been previously buried in a shallow grave, but that entire area had been swept by high water within the previous past few days. Now, the initial coroner's assessment stated that the remains likely belonged to a white Caucasian female. She would have been between 30 to 50 years old. She would have died somewhere between 1962 and 1968. And that same coroner determined that this woman could have had complications giving birth. But despite subsequent investigations, Preble County authorities were unable to identify the remains of that time, which isn't a surprise. It was the late 60s. And they were subsequently buried in Mound Hill Cemetery. Now, several decades later, 
there was a missing woman that they thought could be Preble Penny. So per request of Detective Adam Turner and the Shelby Police Department, the remains were exhumed on August 28th, 2019. And then they started doing initial attempts to extract a working DNA profile, but these initial attempts were unsuccessful. However, in uh, August of 2022, Moxie Forensic Investigations received this case and a sufficient DNA profile was obtained thanks to collaborative efforts with Intermountain Forensics in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Criminal Coffee, because we all funded it. <laughs> yeah, and, and real quick, I don't know how deep you're going to go this, but I think we can say it now, and I don't know if you have it in your script here, but shout out to Intermountain Forensics, first and mm-hmm. foremost, because they are the crux of this whole thing. They're the mm-hmm. cog that would made everything else move. Moxie Forensics did a great job, I believe, once they had a DNA sample or, or a profile, they they solved it in like four weeks. But yeah, once once they got the DNA profile from uh, Intermountain. Intermountain, then they were able to build like a a, a family tree, tree, basically. Yeah. Right, but the thing is, this 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 uh, this DNA s- sequence that they developed, this profile, was not easy. There was a lot of bacteria in there. We had some social media videos where this machine that they use is like a million dollars. And off record, behind the scenes, I can tell you now, they ran it like once or twice and didn't have enough. And yeah. Danny Helwig, who's at the, the captain of the ship over there, we were like, we got to do it again. Now, mind you, it would cost money to do it again. They did not charge us more. They mm-hmm. wanted to solve this as much as we did. So I can tell you what happens, and I didn't even know this, they got a partial sequence the first time. Then they got another partial sequence the second time. And then they went, it might've only been two times. Don't hold me to that fact, but they had to run it multiple times to get the different pieces to create the overall sequence. So a lot of man hours, a lot of time, a lot of machinery used to get that DNA profile, which was eventually used to create that family tree. So shout out to Intermountain for really doing everything they could and basically taking, this is a saying, some of you probably heard turning chicken shit into chicken salad. You ever hear that before? No. Well, now no, you have. Never. Not, not now even you have. Once. Chicken shit into chicken salad, and they they did it. This was not a good sample to work with. It had a lot of bacteria in it from all the water, <laughs> but they were able to do it. Chicken shit, they, shit into chicken they, salads. They Stephanie. turned lemons into lemonade, basically. That's that a, you a know. Little, listen, tomato, tomato. Little, you go with what you want to go. A little bit more with. appetizing, yeah. but so the the crazy thing is though, once they did get this DNA profile. They figured out, oh, this Preble Penny, this unidentified person, had been incorrectly identified as a biological female. And actually, due to the presence of the Y DNA, this person is a biological male. That could make some complications, huh? When you're looking for a female for 60 years. Yeah, they were looking in the wrong place. Yeah. (laughs) They cut their pool in half. They cut their pool in half and it wasn't even the right pool. They weren't even going to find this person. At all, no matter what. I don't care if they had some Star Trek technology in the 60s. They would not find the right person because they were looking in the wrong place. Absolutely. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Yep. So this DNA kit was then uploaded to GEDmatch, which is a DNA database. Um, and then it started to undergo genealogical research on March 28th, 2023. And this is the time when Derek was calling me all the time. And he's like, oh, it's like going to happen any day. Like, what's going on? But it literally... I feel like I feel like they had it that same day because the press release says that Moxie Forensic Investigation released the identification to Shelby County on March 28th. And they said, here's your person. His name's Albert Allen Frost. And so we've got to talk a little bit about Albert because, first of all, Derek and I were talking about this. I don't know if we were still alive when we were talking about it. We were like, this is the coolest name ever, Albert Allen Frost. It's a great, he sounds- great name. Great name, but he had kind of a rocky life. Um, So he was born on January 25th, 1935 to get this. His dad's name is Martin Van Buren Frost. (laughs) Like the president. Mm. Martin Van Buren Frost and Eva Catherine Berryman. And Albert was actually the youngest of eight children born to his parents. It's kind of crazy because it seems that he lost touch with his family. How old did did they say he was? His mother said she lost him when he was 16. I think 1963, 1964 is that when they're approximating that he, he passed away. They said between 63 and 65. They're not exactly okay. sure. But either way, his his nephews, I think it's his brother's kids, his nephews were like, yeah, we saw him sometimes. You know, he would show up 
and he would stay for a little bit. Uh, one of the nephews said the longest he thinks his his uncle stayed around was for like three months. And he actually said he kind of admired him at that time as a kid because he was nine. And he was like, I looked at my uncle Albert and I was like, this guy just goes where the wind takes him. Like he does whatever he wants. He's not like restricted to the the rules of society. He just, he's a rolling stone. But he was also described by his nieces and nephews as being somebody who never really had a home. He kind of was all over the place. Now, we do know that he was a proud military veteran of the United States Army. In fact, he was known to wear his military-issued army jacket everywhere, but he also had some other issues. So it looks like he got married on January 9th, 1959 to Ida Caudill in Campbell County, Tennessee. I even read somewhere that they had adopted a two-year-old girl named Tammy, but then they were divorced on March 22nd, 1960. And it probably was because, like I said, Albert's kind of a rolling stone. He's not staying anywhere for very long. He doesn't, you know, really have like a place that he calls home. And he was into some kind of like trouble. So he got arrested for, um, you know, larceny and things like that. So on March 30th, 1959, right basically a year before they got divorced, he was arrested on a larceny charge for stealing contributions from an Easter seal container at Duke's Tavern. On September 8th, 1960, he was 25 years old and he was fined $100 and sentenced to 30 days in jail for larceny in connection with the theft of a table model radio owned by Mrs. Mallory Hale, who was his sister. So he stole a radio from his sister and he got sent to 30 days in jail for that. And when he got arrested, he had no address to list. So obviously he's kind of all over the place. And then on July 10th, 1961, an article appeared in the local paper that said Albert Frost admits to looting over 100 cars. So at age 26, again, he's charged with larceny. And again, he's arrested by the police. And again, he provides no home address. So it's it's kind of sad in general. It looked like you know, he they they said that they had mistaken him for a woman because of his small stature, but they did know that he wore a dental plate. Um, he had tuberculosis. Was it tuberculosis? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the last time his nephew saw him, um, he had tuberculosis. He was sniffling a lot. You know, he just wasn't doing great at that point. But here's the thing. He kind of vanished. He just lost touch with his family. Albert's family never even knew he was married, by the way, and it's unclear what happened. But between 1963 and 1964, Albert Frost disappeared. No one ever reported him missing. But the thing is, he wasn't the only Frost sibling to vanish mysteriously because his 22-year-old sister, Clara Frost, also went missing, albeit a decade before he did, but still kind of weird. She went missing between 1950 and 1952, and she left two children behind. Her remains have never been found. And so George Frost was Albert's brother and the father to this nephew I keep referring to. George Frost told his children, listen, I there's a rumor and there's like family rumors that have go, been going around that their mother had sold Clara to a German man. And there were also rumors that Albert had been beaten to death outside of a bar and then rolled up in a carpet on someone's porch. Now, these are obviously just rumors. Uh, George Frost is no longer alive. So unfortunately, we cannot ask him because that would be a very interesting thing to ask. Like, why did you think this? You know, where did you get this information from? Is there any... Um, substance to it or was it just something that his it parents a, had come yeah, up with hearsay, just something he heard either way though I, I don't think it's it's crazy to to state that it looks like albert his death was due to nefarious circumstances whoever killed him did try to conceal the remains and you know in a shallow grave but seriously it took a couple of years for the floods and everything and, and the flooding rain to to expose the body but because it was 1968, it just bothers me that when those remains were found in 1968, no, because his family was all still alive, that nobody was like, is that Albert? Maybe because they said, we think this is a woman. And so what if they'd said, this is a man? And then maybe Albert's family would have been like, well, our son is missing. Our brother is missing, you know? Okay. So yeah, there's definitely a few things there. First off, let's go back to the identification because I think it's super cool. We can throw it up on the screen right here. So Moxie Forensics would be w way better at explaining this, but just to give you the 
36,000 feet version. Essentially, they developed that family tree from, from the DNA and they were able to match it to a third cousin, a great niece, and a first cousin once removed. And mm-hmm. the the I don't know who the relative was that they made a physical match with, but once they do all that in within the jet within Jed match, then they actually go and get an actual swab from one of those family members who are willing to do that. And that's when they they come up with the confirmation. Cause obviously you want to get this right. You don't want to have another misidentification. So they went, they had to get in contact with family members, explain what was going on, and then get one to agree to this, even though they didn't really know Albert. You know, it's been a long time since that happened. But back to what you were just saying about three minutes ago, as far as his death, we'll probably never know. I actually would, I would say more than likely we will never know, but I think you're spot on. His, his, his death was definitely concealed. Someone buried him, right? Because Mm -hmm. if he had just passed away along that riverbed, someone would have found him relatively soon after his passing and said, hey, there's a guy who expired over here. We don't, unknown cause of death. Police would have been involved, all that good stuff. No, he was buried and then found much later after the ground eroded away from all of this water. So as you just mentioned, someone buried him quickly, shallow grave with, I believe, the intention on him never being found. And when you couple that, with his criminal history, it's not a far fetch to say, oh, you know, maybe he stole from the wrong person. Yeah. That's all it takes, right? Back then, you steal from the wrong person. And even if it was someone who he had wronged earlier in life, they finally caught up to him, or maybe it was a fight in a bar or something that got out a little out of hand. There's a million scenarios that could play out here. It, again, it's always possible he passed away from illness, but a lo- who buried him then? Who buried him then? And why would they bury him and not tell someone if there was nothing like you said nefarious going on? So if I had to guess, and I'm not just saying it because it's the case we worked, I would say more than likely he was murdered. Mm -hmm. And we just will never, we had a hard time finding out who he was. So the chances of us finding the person responsible, slim to none. But overall, thinking about what we did here, what you did here, because without you guys contributing to Criminal Coffee, this would not be possible. No human being should leave this earth and leave without people knowing their name, right? For all these years, and there's so many of these cases where you have an individual like this who's buried somewhere, and even if they're found by professionals, they're buried, like even this body, even Albert's body was buried somewhere without a tombstone. We have now collectively as a community restored his name and regardless of what you believe in religious wise, it doesn't matter. That in and of itself is profound and impactful and something that every one of you should be proud of because not only are you a true crime consumer, but you have now directly contributed to solving a case. And Detective Turner, Moxie Forensics, they've all said it. Without this funding, that wouldn't have happened. They would have still been looking for a woman who disappeared during that time frame. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the funding was provided that this case was solved. So it's a huge win. And I am so proud of everyone involved. I'm so proud that we were able to take something from our brains and turn it into a reality. I did not think that a year and a half later, after us deciding to start this coffee company, we'd be talking about our first self. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And it shows what you can do if you come together and and actually make a difference in these cases that people sometimes look at us a little weird because we cover true crime or you listen or view, watch true crime. Now you're doing that, you're consuming the content, but also contributing to in a positive way. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. And I mean, I think that um, it's, it's also good for us to have some closure on this because now we can look forward to our next solve, our 100%. next case. And we're excited about that. And we were just talking about it before we recorded, like, okay, what are we going to tackle next? Like, who are we going to help next? What are we going to do next with this, you know, basically this this toolkit that we now have and we know has worked and is effective and we can put it into action more often now. So it's very exciting to focus on what's next. Obviously, it's very sad that Albert died this way. And when you start to be invested in a case this way, and like like we said, it's been a year since we went to Utah. 
So it's been a part of like our weekly routine of checking in with Preble Penny. What's happening with this case? Well, maybe even more so than they probably wanted me to check in. Yeah, mainly Derek. (laughs) I was, I, I, yeah, I was bothering a lot of people. But you get invested into the person that you're trying to identify. And then when you hear his name, when you hear about his story, like you're still invested, you're more invested now. And it feels good to give him his name back and know he's going to have a headstone with his name on it. And he's going to have a place where people can go and and talk to him and, you know, mourn him now properly, whatever living relatives he has left, because he still has people who remember him. You know, he's got his, his nephew who was nine the last time he saw him, but he remembers Uncle Albert and how he thought this guy was so cool for just d- doing what he wanted to do and not letting anybody stop him. And it's it's sad still, though. It's sad still because there could have been many paths for Albert and we will never know what happened. So there's that lack of closure. But at least we know who he is now. Yep. And he didn't just appear as a blip on this earth for a moment in time and then vanish into nothingness. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well said. I mean, talking 25, 26 year old guy who definitely had some issues. And I think the family dynamic there, uh, as I don't think it's saying anything that's out of pocket. The fact that they never even reported him, it kind of gives you an indication of what some of the things may have been going on. But regardless, it doesn't matter. We can only do what we can from our end. And as you said, we're going to do more of them and hopefully more frequently. And we, we do that with you guys. And that's why we promote criminal coffee so much. It's one of those things where we're only going to be able to do as much as we can with that coffee company. As much as we're bringing in, the more cases we can fund. We're already ready to fund our next one. We already have the money for the next one, but we're already thinking, okay, well, that one took a very long time. So ideally, we'd like to have, <laughs> we would like to have two or three going at once, right? Well, that one took a very long time. That one took a very long time. And I don't yeah. want to be I don't want to be the guy who's emailing them constantly like I was, but I felt an obligation to you guys because this is our first case. It's the whole principle behind our company is solving these cold cases or at least funding them. And the website hadn't been updated in a very long time with an update about Preble and you guys were asking us about it. And I was just, you know, I wanted to get the results. So we got them. We learned some things through the process. We're going to fund more cases. They may be doe cases. They may be unsolved homicides. They may be, uh, there's a lot, a lot of you mentioned the sexual assault, the rape kits that are out there. There's thousands of them. Maybe that's an avenue as well. So, you know, we, we have a lot of options on the table. Oh, dude, could you imagine if we if we were able to process one of those rape kits and a rapist was arrested because of it? Why he not? He would be so pissed. He would be so pissed. Why not, though? Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm completely down for it. Why not? In fact that, why can't we? I mean, I think we could do multiple rape kits at once, honestly, and just hope to take to take many rapists in at the same time like a sting rapist arrest well you could have a situation where if they're able to run those kits that multiple kits could come back to the same suspect right you could have a serial rapist that we don't know about yet because those kits haven't been ran and entered into the system so they're just sitting there in an evidence Damn. locker so a lot that can be done we're only one small company but regardless we're making a dent we're putting we're doing what's the other what's the alternative doing nothing and that's yeah. not going to happen. So I think my final words on it, obviously, we're going to put this one to rest. We're going to update the website. I'm actually writing an email as I'm sitting here talking with you guys for the web designer. We're going to put the PowerPoint from Detective Turner's uh, press conference up on the website so you can see that. We'll do a new graphic saying it's solved. And the goal is to eventually have that page filled with solved cases from you guys. And so we're just going to keep moving on to the next one. My final word is thank you. Thank you for supporting the product, right? Because a lot of you are coffee drinkers and uh, support the product regardless. But uh, thank you for making this dream a reality. It oh, is now been... that you say that, don't you have a code for them? Yeah, you know what? We are going to do a code, right? And we want to yeah. do it after you want to do it on his name. Yeah, let's let's do I his think name. It should be like should it be Albert or should it be Frost or should it be Albert Frost? I like Albert Frost. Okay, let's do Albert Frost. Code Albert Frost, and that's going to give you ten percent off your order at Criminal Coffee. Now listen, this is a good thing. Think of it as like a Black Friday deal too, okay? Because the holidays are coming up and we know you know people that like coffee. We know you know people that love coffee, right? Buy a bunch of coffee for yourself and then tell your spouse, hey, this is for my stocking. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you put it in there for me. Just take advantage of the code Gift your family, members, and friends and loved ones criminal coffee because not only are they going to get great coffee, but they're also going to be a part 
of helping us solve these cases as well. And that's great. What better way to bring your family together during the holiday season than to fight crime together? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Our thoughts, prayers with uh, Albert Frost's family, and most importantly, Albert Frost himself. He now has his name back. He can rest in peace, as you said on the press conference. Um, It's a big win. You guys should all be very proud. Uh, Any final words from you other than the code? Yeah. Can we talk about uh, the live really quick? Because I just wanted to address some of the comments who were like, why are Derek and Stephanie hate each other and are so mean to each other? Yep. That's just how we are, like on a regular basis. I don't think that there was anything. No, well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that you you always say too. It's listen, you guys, and I don't even want to make this a thing because I was getting frustrated when that was spoken about in the comments when the focus should be on Albert. But my. 30 second I don't thing. mind it. I just want to reassure you guys, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing going on. We talk to each other every day. Yep. We're very comfortable and familiar with each other. And yep. we we work together. So we just, that's how we talk. And that's how our dynamic is. And we're very happy with it. So you don't have to worry. You don't have that's to worry. It. My frustration yeah. was very simple. It wasn't with Stephanie. In fact, she saved us by getting it up and running. My frustration was, you can hear my passion with this whole thing, to have something take a year. And then have the 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 part that you guys get to see, not be perfect for me is a was a problem. That's a personal thing for me where I just I and Stephanie can knows me like I, I that that shit really bothers me because that's why I told him just calm down. It's fine. You know yeah. I know him. I know he gets like that with certain things, and I don't get like that with those things because for me it's just like yo we're doing our best. Yeah, and if it's not good enough, then it's not good enough. But I can't do any better right now. Like this is all I have to give, and I'm okay with that. And if you're not okay with it, then you're not okay well, with I it. I wanted like, to be there. Remember, I was going to try to go. They invited yeah. us to go. I was going to try yeah. to go, and obviously, if I was it's there, just such a busy time. That shit would have been perfect. You know what I mean? Like we would have had cameras. Would have like, had a microphone. <laughs> you would have had everything. And so those thoughts are running through my head too. Like you know what? I should have just said f it and got on a flight. But no. That's really all I got to say about Like, it. you think that you're a perfectionist and you think you're a control freak until you meet Derek, right? Yeah, it's so like, basically. I'm very type A. I'm a perfectionist. I'm a control freak. But also, I have a very, like, let go and let God kind of demeanor, too. So when things yeah, get too stressful- Yeah, you're able to self-medicate. Yeah, for when things get too stressful for me, I'm like, eh, I can't do anything yeah. about it. <laughs> you know, it's just my my coping mechanism. His is different and we balance each other out and we know how to soothe each other in the times when we're both triggered. So what you see is a dynamic that you don't often see because it's just how we are with each other all the time. But we work well together. We balance each other out. We're perfectly fine. There's no animosity. And and that's it. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You don't all. have to worry. Yeah. I mean, you can still comment, but I just feel like yeah. in that moment, we got to focus on what's important. And for me- Not even for you guys. There was a point that it was a really gratifying moment for me because I'm not a full-time detective anymore. I have a PI firm, but my job for 13 years was the gratification of solving a case. And it wasn't always a case like this. It was sometimes just a a larceny or or, or a B&E, something really simple. But you put in all that work and then you get the result in that that feeling, that dopamine hit, as you would describe it, Stephanie, that feeling of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I don't normally get all the time covering cases that aren't mine on Crime Weekly. So- to have that experience, to have that feeling again, and to also be able to share it with you guys was really cool for me, and, and it makes me just want to do more of them. So I'm all about it. I'm happy. I'm excited. I want to do 15 cases right now, but we would go bankrupt as a cup- company if I did. So we can't. <laughs> not yet, anyways. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. We're gonna get one there, day. Though. One day. One day soon. I hope. No, yeah. absolutely, guys. It'll be all updated on the website. Just a reminder: it's Albert Frost. Just 10% Albert Frost. Off Albert Frost. That's it. A L B E R T F R O S T, all one word. Uh, use all caps. Let's go all caps. I'm going to put it in there as all caps. You'll get ten percent off. I'll probably do it till the end of the month. But yeah, go check it out. We appreciate the love and support. We're gonna get ready to record Crime Weekly Part Two. Everyone, stay of Maya safe. Maya Kowalski, out there. Crime Weekly. Maya Kowalski Part Two. Yeah, that's right. Part yeah. Two coming out. We got that coming. It'll come out. And actually, this is going to come out on Thanksgiving Day. So. Yeah. You know, happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy it. We will talk to you guys soon. Stay safe out there. Later.